So I wanted to start by saying, knowing that you retired, is it two years ago now? As three, three, three years. Three years ago, wow, time flies. Yeah. As chair of the company, how your life has changed and what you're dedicating yourself to now? Life changed in many ways, some good, some bad. Mm. Uh, as the day got closer to retirement, you began to, to feel afraid that you didn't have enough to do, <laughs> or you would not have enough to do, and you tried to uh, mitigate those circumstances by, by being overambitious in terms of what you would undertake to do. Started out with a very simple uh, and enjoyable environment of wanting to relearn to play the piano, to, to paint again, which was something I enjoyed doing when I was much younger. And those two things have never happened. Uh, my, my staff at home says that there doesn't seem to be any change. I'm at home less than I used to be. And this is the year that I have to rationalize what I, and reassess what I undertook to do with great ambition. Uh, the, the good part is that, that I've had an opportunity to pursue something that has been in the back of my mind for some time, and that was the degree of malnutrition that, that strikes most of the, or many of the children in India, leading to physical and mental deformity, uh, leading to their inability to be educated, and that has been part of my frontal uh, commitment, if, if you might. And what we're trying to do is to embed nutrients and iron in wheat, in the staple food, in wheat and rice, and, and to make this a, a part of, of the nutritional intake of children and mothers. Mm. We need the government's help, which happily enough has been very forthcoming. Oh, good. And uh, it will be something that's not what politicians like to see because you can't see uh, healthy children on the face of it looking tremendously different from those who are not. But over a period of time, wherever I may be, may not be on this planet, it would be very heart, heartwarming to think that you made a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when we talked three months ago or so in Mumbai, you said that there was a second piece to it which was trying to improve livelihoods of rural yes. people. Thank you. With all that, was, that we were trying to do, we realized that that wasn't everything. You could have good health, that was wonderful, but you had to have a livelihood. And most of us forgot that. And, and most of us in philanthropic endeavors uh, focus on reaching a level of uh, well-being that is better than what you have. And, but what you have is so horrible or horribly poor or deficient, that being better than that may still make you below the poverty line. And, and what we all must try to do is to concern ourselves with, not with just giving handouts or, or providing education or, or providing means of access, but that we have to find a way to to provide livelihood and sustainable livelihood to communities. That may be, it may be getting fishing back to the fishermen on, on the beach rather than having to, having to troll the high seas. It may be 
having silkworms or having a silk industry or a bamboo industry. We need to be innovative. We need to see what we can do to provide this livelihood to the less fortunate people. That's great. And I happen to know there's several people in this room interested in the same thing. I'm assuming you're actually looking for partners. Oh, yes, very much so. And we're very happy to work with partners or to help people who want to do this on their own mm -hmm. uh, do so. Great. This is, this is a somewhat different approach than the Tata Trust took, say, 50 years ago. Am I right? Well, the Trust concerned itself with ways of increasing the yield, agricultural yield, of uh, conserving and harvesting water, mm -hmm. which made a difference in the community, but it was never meant to provide sustainability. It was just meant to provide a better life. And regrettably, I think that's just not enough. And we have to, we have to look at this in the form of how can we bring sustainable uh, livelihood to a community? It may be making investments in our companies in those areas. It may be providing industries that could be located and creating capability for these people to use mm -hmm. that environment. But it needs to be something, and we need to consciously be concerned with not just handouts, not just uh, donations, but to get a prosperous community in place. And if we can do this, I think we would reduce the burden on some of us because these would be sustainable people who would be uh, useful citizens in their country. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And changing the topic slightly, um, many of you know, but perhaps not all, that India recently passed a law requiring corporations to give 2%, is it of their gross income or? Uh, net income. Net income um, for corporate social responsibility initiatives. This is pretty unusual in the world. And I'd love to hear your opinion on how that's going and how you think it could go. I'm very enthusiastic about the scheme. I'm also very skeptical about uh, a scheme that where hundreds or maybe thousands of new NGOs will be established to, to receive this money, uh, where corruption could emerge as, as the main beneficiary of, of all this uh, money, which some corporates are looking upon as just a tax. Yeah. No heart, no interest, just find an NGO, find an avenue to fulfill this need, and I've done my, my bit. I think there will be a period of time when this rather laudable uh, endeavor will, will be uh, found to be uh, exploited and there will be some, some reversal or leg, legislative reversal. And maybe it would not be a bad thing for the government to specify NGOs or organizations that are equipped to, to deal with this large influx of money and make this part of a national effort, maybe in five or six major areas. Right now, there's no definition of of this, so I think it's going to be a learning experience, mm -hmm. hopefully not a wasteful one. Mm -hmm. um, I know not only the Tata Trust, but a number of other Indian philanthropists, quite a few of whom are in this room to honor you, um, have lead positions. Do you think there's a way that either individual business leaders, philanthropists, or business associations could encourage or even provide training um, Absolutely. For companies that are yeah. new to this? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. But they, they have to take that initiative. Yeah. Uh, and maybe those in the room would, and those that they touch outside the room, could help undertake that initiative yeah. 
in, in this, this year and the coming years. Yeah, I, that would be it will so take an effort. Yeah, I'm it sure it won't will. just happen. What I'm guessing is that probably in each state, there are already socially minded business leaders who could play a leadership role in that because you can't just have one group for the whole country. Yes. Do you think that's yes. a possibility? Yes, uh, I think if there could be showcase locations, yeah. then there will be efforts made to replicate the good that has been done. Yeah, yeah. And given India's economic growth in the last few years and it's really taking center stage on a world basis, what do you see as the role for Indian business leaders and philanthropists on the global scene? I, I think we're, India is fortunate in that it's emerging with the new government, mm -hmm. which is uh, carving out a new, a new roadmap for India. And the good, the good part is that it centers around improving the, the prosperity of the people of India. The details uh, or the challenges in the details of implementing this in a realistic, uh, non-exploitive manner. Mm -hmm. And the jury will have to be when this uh, implementation takes place. It's yeah. a little early to, to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and my last question, we're going to let you off the hook pretty soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've noticed in the last, say, 10 years, a huge growth in Indian philanthropy, quite apart from the 2% law. And it feels to me as though much of that philanthropy is getting increasingly strategic and impactful. Could you comment on how you see the Indian philanthropy scene growing? I, I, uh, I think there's an awakening of philo uh, philanthropy. I don't see uh, a huge growth in philanthropy other than building edifices. Hmm. There, there, needs to be, there needs to be a sensitivity to the fact that you can build hospitals, schools, uh, temples, and such. They have their value, but that amount of money going out to the people is, is really the key. And if, if, one can make, if one can make that happen in a meaningful way that moves the energies, the innovativeness, and the intuition of, of the Indian businessmen to the people of India, yeah. uh, rather than building edifices which have names and monuments, which is traditionally the manner in which uh, mm -hmm. philanthropy used to be given, then we would reach out and benefit many of the people. And, and the sad part is we're a country now of over a billion people, yeah. growing uh, at a very fast rate. And those people have aspirations of their own. Young kids want to be prosperous people. They, they want to have livelihood. We need to do something mm -hmm. to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe that philanthropy needs to be in a form that relates to the people, not providing them edifices only. Yeah. There's yeah. a need for hospitals, there's yeah. a need for schools, yeah. there's a need for temples, but there's a need much, much larger waiting for them with the people. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged, for example, by the um, short history, maybe 10 years of Dazra, which is an organization committed to bringing younger entrepreneurs mm -hmm. into philanthropy and actually teaching them um, how, to, how to analyze an organization, how to volunteer, how to give money. Um, and I'm hoping that there will be other organizations like that around India. That's in Mumbai, but they now are operating in Delhi and I think several other states. And that seems to me the kind of thing, especially with the new generation, that could bring more people into philanthropy that goes beyond, as you say, just building buildings. It could. It yeah. could. 
I, I'd just like to say something. Uh, we're, we're sitting here today in the aftermath of a calamity in Nepal, little country far, far away, great devastation. And that's another example where we have people spinning their wheels, we have governments uh, not knowing what to do, we have philanthropists who haven't stepped forward as yet to, to meaningfully do something. These are the moments when the world has to come together and, and not lose sight of a small country at the foothills of the Himalayas where, where devastation has, has taken away the livelihood, low livelihood that these people have. Yeah. And that's an example of what can we do, what can philanthropy do, what can governments do at those times of needs, and what should be done to rehabilitate a nation. Thank you so much for bringing that in. It really brings it down to earth with something that's really happening yeah. today. So I really appreciate your being willing to do this. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow Thank you. you. Thank you so much.